Hey, I'm attorney Vince Phillips, and I'm rocking with Brianna from Hip Hop United. So just, you know, a quick tour. Some of the plaques that have been uh, received over the years. Uh, you know, it'd be a young boy. This was an interesting uh, story that uh, the song. So our publishing company, uh, myself and Lil John, we have a publishing company. And uh, one of the songs that uh, he produced was Freakily. So an interesting story about the song Freakily is that uh, it was done around the same time as the Usher song, Yeah. And the reality is the original Yeah record was written to the same beat as, as Freakily. And uh, unbeknownst to John, at the time that, uh, that we placed that song on Usher, uh, Petey Pablo had the Freakily record already, because John had a beat CD out. And so uh, we had to figure out what to do because we had two artists over the same track. Uh, of course, John was not gonna lose that Usher placement. You know, Petey Pablo at the time was a new artist. So, um, uh, they initially tried to ch make changes to the Freak League record and they just couldn't, they couldn't do it. So they ended up changing the Usher record. And if you go back and listen, um, you probably notice the similarities. Mm -hmm. Well, now, I'm, I'm going to take it up to Lil Baby because, you know, he's popping right now. Okay. And, you know, drip too hard. Right. This is, this is a, this actually is a, a plaque for Lil Baby. And um, this is from Drip Too Hard. We got to, we got to. Big, the big plaque here, and um, our office had initially ordered it for Lil Baby because we really appreciate him as a client. And then before I knew it, he had a bigger one than the one that we ordered, so we said, okay, we're fine, we'll just keep it. Um, and it's, it, it don't hurt to have a nice, big, pretty plaque in the office. Uh, so we got we got that, and that, this is when he really was kind of taking off. He really, really was initially um, you know, becoming where he is today. So we're very proud of, of him and, uh, and his drive. Uh, we just kind of talked a moment about about Kevin and, and and his ride too. So you know the interesting thing that's happening with him right now is some of you know some of his uh, older records, a record that's a year a year old right now, is suddenly uh, taking off on the charts. And so um, you know it's kind of cool the way I guess the TikTok um, movement is happening, where it's it's really kind of changing the nature of the game. Uh, it's all about really, to me, more so just get the content out uh, because fans might find it immediately or they might find it a year later. But the more content that you have out, the more likely they are to be able to find it. Uh, you know, it used to be very first week driven. How do, how do I record do it in the first week? And of course, people still care about the first week. But I think that in the long run, the game is going to start to change and become more about, you know, uh, you know how much content you have out because a lot of times older content um, older content gets you know gets picked up. Uh, mm -hmm. We see that TikTok really has become more more catered to catalog records than, than brand new records uh, mm -hmm. more recently. What's your thoughts on this whole TikTok movement? Because it's like what I've been noticing a lot of artists. I'm not gonna say they're not talented, but a lot of artists they they're creating these little TikTok campaigns, right. challenges, and next thing you know, they have hits. Right. And it's not even like a, a, a song; it's just like a hook, a, re, a repetitive Well, the real hook. question, yeah, the real question after that is, you know, can they come and do it again? You know, right. uh, I have a couple of clients who recently did deals, and their songs did take off on TikTok. So you know, we we got spot him, got him, and he has his record. Um, beatbox that everybody was doing a little walk and dance to. Right. Right, you know. <laughs> and uh, and then we also represent Mooski and Mooski's song, mm -hmm. um, okay. Track Star, that mm -hmm. um, kind of took off on TikTok right. as well. So, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm on all the clients now because I tell them, you know, the career is not made on one song. The career is made on, you know, continuously putting out good music. Both of them are really creative. Both of them are really good artists. So, um, you know, my thought on TikTok, it's kind of become like your street team now. Right. So back in the day of Lil John and Scrappy and Trillville, you know, we used to have people out there passing out the records, pushing it in the streets, mm -hmm. hand to hand. And I'm not against that still going on. I think it's, I think, I think it's still uh, something that people should do. Mm -hmm. But TikTok allows you to kind of do that sort of thing worldwide and faster, digital. right, in yeah. a digital way. And so what happens is the TikTok uh, influencers really are becoming like the people who are just giving people a snippet of something. Mm -hmm. But you know, you can't make something go viral. 
you know, they're trying to figure out how to make something viral. But if they knew how to just like say, okay, we're gonna make this one viral, then uh, they would do it for every record they put out. You know, it's a lot of record that people have tried to pop onto TikTok, but you have to find out if it's the one that the people right. are gonna take to, if the, you know, if it, if it becomes the one that people catch. It's, it's all about just being creative with it. You know, yeah. it's a certain skill you have to have, I think. And some people do make quote unquote TikTok talks, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's, a, there's a young producer named 217 on the track that we represent. 217 has a has kind of a niche of making, you know, he 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 already was originally making the, the songs that kind of kids do the nay nay and the hit them folks and all those little dances to. Mm -hmm. And so his song, his sound became kind of synonymous with those catchy dances. And so he's, he's found a way to kind of make a whole lane for himself where it's really almost like catered to his particular audience and they go on TikTok and they make these certain kind of dances to it. So, you know, some people have really got creative in that kind of way. I was just gonna point out, you know, how publishing works. So when when Drake made, made his for free record, he started off with It Goes On and On, which was originally a two short line. And the production from that was produced by Lil Jon, so we had we had publishing on it. So ultimately, they had to come to us on the Drake on the new Drake record to get clearance for publishing from the record that we put out years ago. So how do how do it work? Like as far as clearance goes, like you just pretty much essentially asking they use for a company. Normally, mm -hmm. they'll use a, a, a middle company, mm -hmm. and that company that contacted us, so they sent us the record first, and they said, you know, listen to. Um, listen to it and tell us what you know what share you want to uh, claim on it so we'll listen the different musicians and the people that were involved with the original record we'll talk about it together and ultimately come to a, a uh, decision of what they would like to ask for back so a lot of times they might say look uh, this is what they like to give you and then we might say well we feel like it should be this much right we give we might get more spots so we might say you know that sounds about right and, and go with the offer we had the independent records. We had been independent at that time for about five years. <clears throat> it was interesting because now, when an artist has a buzz, the deals come pretty fast. Mm -hmm. But back then, they didn't really give record deals to street, at least not for street music in Atlanta, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. people like Kilo Ali or Raheem the Dream would go mm -hmm. a whole career, be huge, and mm -hmm. never get a record deal. Like, you know, nowadays, you get one record mm -hmm. and the deal is coming. Mm -hmm. So we had been independent for about five years at the time. And so we were known, but we weren't, you know, huge yet. Mm -hmm. uh, P called, asked me to come check out the music. I let him come over, you know, I listened to it and I, I actually picked the record. I picked um, Get On My Level. I told mm -hmm. him that I said, that's, I said, that's I your record. Damn. Yeah. I was like, you guys should work that record. And Damn. come back to me. So. Next time I heard about them, they, you know, they said come out and check it out. So I came out to see the show. Saw a whole crowd going crazy for them, and I was just about to leave. And then the DJ said, "Y'all know what's next." And everybody started doing like this. Mm. I was like, "Let me see who's next." <laughs> and then Scrappy came out. Wow! And killed it. Wow. But see, that record is still jamming to this yeah, day. Buster. Yeah. Yes, yeah. to this day. And get on my level. Really. Yeah, yeah, both of them. Yeah. Nook if you records. bug, all of them. Right, Cry Mob, Nook if you bug. So, yeah, Cry Mob picked up the head buzzing thing after Scrappy. That was Scrappy's thing first. Uh -huh. And then, really, kind of, uh, Scrappy sort of identified Cry Mob. So, when we signed Cry Mob, we signed them, we signed them through Scrappy's company. Mm. Right, so he kind of gave them the, the, the punch in the hand thing. Right. Right? He gave them it, that his, his, uh, his trademark. This is a legendary concept, man. Salute to you. Congratulations on everything, too. Thank you. You got an A and on the air, man. Where the music passion came from, though? Like, I mean, outside of being an owner, but, you know. Uh, you know, um, we always just liked music, like you know? Music. We liked music. Yeah. We were, you know, in a band, in a band. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've known Lil Jon since the eighth grade. Mm -hmm. So, even back then, we were both in band. Okay. Um, but I didn't know what the music industry was. It wasn't It wasn't something that I thought was real because Atlanta wasn't a music industry town yet. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> so I didn't, I never thought, you know, much of it, you know, mm -hmm. but then uh, our partner Cersei started, was a DJ. Mm -hmm. He was DJing. He taught John how to DJ before he left off for the service when we graduated high school. Mm -hmm. 
and then Josh started DJing and he was just driven. He would DJ all the right places, ultimately ended up in, in like the hottest clubs. Mm-hmm. Our crew was like helping promote the clubs and so we just happened to watch the music, stri- music industry unfold in front of us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah. we, we saw the first, you know, artists start to take off in Atlanta. Um, we saw Jermaine Dupri come in mm-hmm. and push Criss Cross. We saw Dallas Austin come in and push ABC. Mm-hmm. These dudes were our age, so mm-hmm. it was kind of like, man, okay, what 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 is this? <laughs> you know what I mean? I think you had artists like what, like Jack the Ripper, or oh, well, Jack the Rapper was a Jack the Rapper convention. Yeah. Convention, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He was a, he was like an old school radio uh, promotion guy. Yeah. You know, so yeah. he had this convention every year, Jack the Rapper. Yeah. It was crazy. Yeah, I heard a lot. I think that's when I first got like, because I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. So okay. I started to hear about the music or just the the ecosystem of hip hop in general through him, like at least down here. Like, right. And I was like, wow, this this is super dope, man. This yeah, dope. no, Jack the Rapper was, you know, was really the platform for a lot of people, mm-hmm. you know, and it brought a lot of people to Atlanta mm-hmm. trying to get into the music industry and, and it probably brought a lot of attention to Atlanta, to be honest. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. definitely, definitely. I agree too. I agree too. Oh, man, congratulations again, man. This, this is dope, man. You're definitely inspirational for sure. All right. Super dope. Well, I'm, I'm, you know, that's what I do. I talk to help yeah. people's stories and try to help get uh, the new artists ready and try to put them to the next level. So now it's Young Boy and Kevin yeah. Gates and Lil Baby. Yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned guys. that. What are, you, what are you looking for in these new artists? I mean, to me, it's more about the drive. You know, it's mm-hmm. hard for me to say... Or oh, I could just pick the music, you know, mm-hmm. um, because it's got the, the ear of the of the of the listening audience is always changing. So, but one thing that hasn't changed is the need to have that charisma, that personality, that drive. You know, um, I, I tell people if you if, if you're if you have a lane where you are kind of working harder than your artist is, mm-hmm. then it's not going to happen. Absolutely. The artist has to be the hardest hardest working person in the situation. Mm-hmm. I, learned, I learned that from John when John was pushing for him and the East Side Boys and once he created his thing it made it much easier for a trivial or scrappy yeah, around mob to come in with the same kind of sound and brand mm-hmm. you know but I mean at this point you see that young boy has his own sound his own brand yeah. you see that uh, you know Lil Baby has his own sound his whole his own brand they, they've created their own thing mm-hmm. uh, but they've all been the ones that pushed and drove this thing, you know. I watched Kevin Gates, um, you know, from 2012, you know, create something out of nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, but he had that personality, mm-hmm. you know. How important do you think uh, having a team in the music industry is? A hundred percent important. Mm-hmm. They're not gonna. Ha- it's not gonna happen. So number one, yes, the artist has to be driven. Mm-hmm. The artist has to have that 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 push. But the other part is he has to have really good people around him mm-hmm. to support that push that he's given. Mm-hmm. When artists, you know, are, are out here, you know, pushing and they do it alone, mm-hmm. it's just tough, you yes. know, and you can't do it all. Right. Right. Yeah, I personally feel like um, lawyers are um, the secret weapon or the, you know, behind an artist. So for those who are like not familiar with as far as like when to come to you, when do an artist need to come to you? Well, certainly uh, an artist should come to an attorney before they sign anything with anybody. Okay. And if you're building a team, uh, there's going to be a time when the team is going to want some, something in writing to make sure they're secure. So even if it's your manager, your manager's probably going to give you a, a, a contract to sign. Uh, even if it's your um, um, your management, your, uh, your agent, at some point you're going to get a business manager who does your finance. And, and if, you know, if you're being successful, you're going to have a record deal, a publishing deal, any of these opportunities come along, mm-hmm. you're going to need a lawyer for it. Mm-hmm. Separately, I also think you need a lawyer, if you, if you can find, if you could be blessed enough to find a lawyer that can give you the guidance, not just understand the paperwork, but actually mm-hmm. give you the guidance That's very important. and give you direction That's and point you in the right direction and tell you what to stay away from and tell you what to expect next. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the kind of lawyer that you want to have. Mm-hmm. Now, I think, um... Uh, Lawyers are amazing. Y'all, y'all are so slept on, so underrated. Well, to the people who doesn't know. Right. I, mean, I just say that. Right. People who do know got you. So. Right, right. But um, now I, mean, I just think, um, you know, I got a chance to see a lot of deals broker. You know, whether it was labels, whether it was huge partnerships, um, investments, things of that sort. And one thing is, it's always a lawyer behind it. So that's, like, so that's what I'm like, man. Deal makers. Yeah, we definitely need Definitely need That is dope. That's real dope. 
and I, and I pride myself on being a deal maker, you know, uh, because you you got to know how to push and get what your client needs, but do it in a way that the other side says, "Man, that was tough, but I I, I don't mind. I appreciate it." And they end up they end up giving you what you need, and it's in the, and, and and you try not to make it hurt so bad when you, when you, when you get when you get what you need for your client. You yeah, know? for sure, for sure. Well, no, so my question is, man, how do you select your clients? I mean, because I know you at the point where they reaching out to you. Yeah, but like, how do you? I, I, I look. I usually really look for people that are actually doing something that's making it happen, mm -hmm. or. You know, so sometimes they've gotten pretty far. Sometimes they have a deal at the table already. Mm. Or sometimes I see the drive and I see what it can be, and I can recognize that 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 thing, that same thing that I saw in Lil John, the same thing I saw in Kevin Gates. It's like, okay, mm. I see that this is can happen. They just yeah. don't need that guidance. Think that guidance, yeah. right? Right. That's dope, man. That's dope. Okay. Once again, we're here with Vince Phillips, Esquire, attorney at law. You know. Here at his office, we're you know taking you on a tour of you know all things Mr. Phillips. Okay. Uh I know that um, we definitely speak on panels, so I know it's definitely a blessing trying to catch you and just hear you speak, you know. So what's some other things you do for the community? Um, so I'm I'm a part of a nonprofit. I'm on I sit on the board of a nonprofit called YouthSpark. And YouthSpark is an amazing organization. Um, um, it started actually 25 years ago now. And the uh, and and it initially and still very much so is, is, is tackling the problem of, of the child sex tra sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that they did is uh, go into the courts system in Georgia and lobby in Fulton County to have the the, the, the youth that are arrested for sex trafficking or for sexual offenses and identify them as victims and not actually as criminals. So they pull them out, separate them away from being considered criminals, instead of considering them victims of child sex trafficking. And so they lobbied for that and they got that changed and now they actually have a physical location in the uh, in the juvenile court system so that when they pull them out, uh, the, the, you know, these young people, they can bring them to the youth spark office and within that space, it's like a safe space for them. They can talk, they can communicate. They can, you know, often, you know, go into like a closet and get some clothes, help them relocate, help them find another way so that they're not dropped right back into those same situations. But uh, but the, the the mission is kind of expanded with Youth Spark and now dealing with um, just any time that adults are uh, taking advantage of young people because even when you see kids take stealing cars and things of that nature, a lot of times that's a grown adult having a teenager go and steal those cars and bring it to them. So these kind of things are being tackled. Um, also during the uh, you know during the uh, unrest and the and the, and the protests that were going on last year. One of the things that me and, and another gentleman did was uh, we, we sent a lot of food out. You know, um, in, in Louisville, Kentucky, they basically did Occupy Kentucky. And I was on a, uh, I was on a call with Tamika Mallory and some others, and they were talking about, you know, look, when you guys get here, it's a grocery desert, the, the grocery store had burned down due to the, uh, due to the unrest and there was really no plan to rebuild, so it had really become a grocery desert. They were looking for attorneys to be able to represent them, but I can't represent people there in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. But what I did hear was that need, so I contacted a friend of mine and we ended up um, loading up, for three weeks straight, we loaded up uh, about a thousand boxes of produce every week, put them on trucks and sent them out there to them. So when you, if you look at the Until Freedom uh, page and go back you know, to that time, mm -hmm. you'll see them taking those boxes to the community um, and, and going straight door to door. So that was, that was literally us taking those, those you know, the, the truck loads, and putting them together and paying for a truck driver and paying for a truck and sending it to them every week. Lessons, that's yeah. a lesson. That's wow. Awesome. wow. Yeah, just, um, you know, a lot of things have been happening during the COVID anyway, but a lot of the, you know, like with Lecrae, him um, getting the um, the portable uh, sanitation booths, oh, yeah. that type of stuff. Yeah. Um, are you still doing stuff right now um, regarding just, you know, giving back? Uh, 
You know, I, in I, Georgia. I, I'm mostly as far as what I try to do, you know, is really kind of stay in good conversation with the young people. Because, okay. you know, in 1992, we had a similar moment, right? It was Rodney King, and I was, uh, you know, I was 20, 20, 21 years old at the time. And I was out there, you know, we were, we were active in the streets, actively pushing, actively talking. And, and so I tell the kids, look, you know, I'm going on 50 now. I, I want to see, I want to see y'all out there. I want to see you, you know, making a difference, you know, not busting windows and not, you know, you know, committing a crime, but definitely being heard and making your voice heard, making your opinion heard. And let's hold these people to what they promised us. You know, I think that right now we recognize the power of the politics. Mm -hmm. And so right now we had a lot of politicians that gave us a, a whole lot of, you know, what they're going to give to the, to the black community, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in exchange for that vote. And so now it's time to really hold their feet to the fire. And I want to make sure that the, you know, so I'm in the kind of the ear of the young people a lot, just making them understand it's real, it's important, and it's and it's you know, you look, we're 100 years from um, the burning of Black Wall Street and Greenwood, right? Um, and uh, and to some degree, you know, they they say it was an angry mob, but also it was a city, it was the you know, it was the government involved with that. Why is that possible? Because we you know we were able to have that say we cannot let that kind of thing you, you think it can't happen again it could right they could and so we have to be smart we have to be diligent we have to be active we have to really you know speak with our with our our, our, our protest we also got to speak at the ballot box and continue to do it mm -hmm. definitely what's next for you um for me i'm just going to continue to grow you know I, you know i told somebody the other day they said man, you're a legend, you know, you did all this and that. And I said, well, I'm not done. I'm nowhere near done. You know, this is, this is um, to me, a brand new beginning. The music industry itself has changed. The music industry uh, has been has been given new life through, through streaming and some of the things we talked about, TikTok. But also I've been uh, engaged in production and film. So, you know, I've always kind of worked in, in in two ways, sort of, you know, as an attorney, but also as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And so the entrepreneur side of me, you know, like I said, own the label with Little John, BME. Uh, the entrepreneur side might, you know, uh, produce a TV show or produce a film. Uh, and then on the other side, I've always been active in, you know, guiding people, giving the consultations and being an attorney. Mm -hmm. So uh, those things will continue and continue to grow and take to the next steps. And then I'm looking at different different entrepreneurial spaces as well. You know, it's always good to to keep your horizons open. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, I'm looking forward to uh, tapping in with you um, on some ideas that I have. Okay. Um, that right. I could discuss with you. You know, well, later I'm looking on. forward to hearing about them. Whenever Definitely. You're ready. Definitely. Yeah, I've been kind of laying low during the uh, COVID, but you know, things are starting to uh, open back up. And me and him were like kind of brainstorming as far as like what can we do for the community, uh, for the hip hop community. Okay. Um, Cause I did a panel back in 2018. I had like T.I., uh, Tigger, a few others on the panel. And I'd like to do something like that again. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna definitely, you know, tap in with you when I'm ready. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I'll sit on the panel or get out there. And if it's going to be inside, we'll be inside. If it's outside, we'll be outside. <laughs> Wherever it is. Right. Yeah, you know. Right. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I appreciate what you guys are doing. I appreciate mm -hmm. the vehicle that you've given mm -hmm. to uh, let, letting the young people hear, you know, opportunities and awesome. how to get there and, and learn learn behind the scenes. Because all too often we, 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 we love the talent of talent, mm -hmm. but our community doesn't really teach people to appreciate the talent of business, mm -hmm. you know? And so, you know, if you think about it, a lot of other cultures, it's really like well-respected. The talent of business is well-respected in mm -hmm. other cultures. But for us, it's more like, you know, if you shoot the ball or if you rap the song or if you, you know, that's the talent that we're taught to really look at. And that's great. We just, mm -hmm. not, we also have to uh, learn to appreciate the talent of doing the business too because those go hand in hand to success absolutely i definitely i totally agree as far as the music industry you know um the music is changing we have more artists than we ever had before yeah, yeah. <laughs> the barrier to entry is gone you right. know, it used to cost money to get in you know, right. to press up vinyl and 
mail it out or take it to mm -hmm. places. Now you just, mm -hmm. you know, put in email addresses and push send. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, but yeah, so it's more than ever. <laughs> yeah, they, it's just, they just are rising. So as the music business is changing, right, as far as the entry point as an artist, um, um, how does it change for an entertainment lawyer as far as brokering deals or um, <coughs> just, I guess, you know, collecting clientele? Like, does it basically, essentially, is it is it changing in the entertainment area as well as it's changing? A couple of ways, yeah. I mean, number one, like you just mentioned, the, the amount of artists that are coming out, so mm -hmm. it, 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 it uh, raises the volume of work, mm -hmm. you know, there's a, there's a much larger volume of work because more people try and give it a shot, right. you know, and so we are, we, we are a tool for anyone that's trying to strike gold, so mm -hmm. it's like, uh, it's kind of like in the old days when people were out there searching for gold, mm -hmm. um, you know, some people struck gold, some didn't, but pretty much you always had to buy a pick, a shovel, or an axe. We are one of those things that you need to buy along the way while you try to see if you can, you know, strike gold right. with your creative talents. Uh, but the other side is, um, you know, I think that because people can get their own distribution, they can, you know, kind of find their own audience. You see more and more people able to reach, you know, higher levels before they necessarily take a deal or maybe don't even want to take uh, uh, a you know, traditional recording deal. Mm -hmm. So I think it's opened up a lot more options mm -hmm. uh, and, and the way that the contracts are structured. Mm -hmm. um, it used to be very, you know, very much like this is what is mm -hmm. sort of the uh, standard operation. Mm -hmm. And now because, you know, they have to, um, you know, the, the the options had to be opened up because there's so many different places that are willing to come and, and you know work with the talent um, and so once the talent had more options then the labels had to give you more options on the, the way the deals would be structured that's awesome that's yeah. awesome so what's some things you can pretty much say to an up and coming and take a lawyer especially if they're like 19 20 you know fresh in college right things that are sort what's some what's some advice you can give them because of course it's a long road so yeah so i think uh i think one of the key things is to acknowledge and recognize that this uh, business on the legal side is ever changing we're in the middle of a historic moment um and so if, if you're a young up and coming entertainment attorney you know stay on the cutting edge of things as they're happening be you know be aware because you know we, we've gone from physical CDs to streaming, you know, the, the, the platforms have changed and so the income and the streams and the way that the money is made has changed and also from that normally requires certain laws that follow. Once they see the way that things kind of play out, then certain laws such as the way mechanical royalties are paid and things like that had to follow. Um, so the Digital Modernization Act, for instance, just came, you know, just happened. So we're living in the history of, you know, of the, um, of the music business, we're living in a moment where a major um, seismic shift is happening in the way the business is done. So if I'm a young entertainment attorney, I try to stay really focused on where things are going. And also, I think, uh, you know, stay in love with the music, stay in love with the, uh, you know, love the music and love the law, right? Love the, love the, love the, the copyright law and then love the copyrights themselves. Um, and, um, and, and, and if you're also lucky enough to be, you know, engaged with talent, you know, closely engaged, because that's when, you, when you're a young attorney, you're probably around the same age as your clients. You know, in my early days, I was, I had Young Bloods and Little John and Pastor Troy and, you know, all these guys back then. And we were, you know, I, was, I could have beer with them and stuff like that, because I was, I was, we were all like trying to get it together. Uh, and so I think that was really a blessing for me. You know, I had a young Jeezy back then. Um, and those things were a blessing because I was, uh, I was able to be, you know, amongst them as we, you know, forged this path together. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, that if I'm a young attorney, I would do, I'll do that all over again. Nowadays, I'm too old. They don't want to hang out with me. And I don't, I'll probably go to sleep, you know, if they want to go hang out, you know. So, um, so the, but that was, a, that was a great time in my life. That's dope. That's awesome. That's question. How important is mentorship, especially if you're very new into an industry or just let's put it in an entertainment lawyer phase? How important is mentorship? Well, I mean, for entertainment law or 
any business, mm -hmm. anything, you know, mentorship is, is very important because, you know, I tell people all the time, you can go through the same mistakes that, you know, you can, that others have made, or you can have someone around you close enough to tell you how to avoid those mistakes, how to not bump your head in these particular ways. Uh, and so when you have a mentor, a mentor can guide you and help move these things along and move you along in your career faster, give you that, that direction and, and really help you see what your end goal is and help you help you reach that end goal. Um, and, uh, and, and I think it's important uh, both ways, you know, I think when you, when you mentor somebody, you know, you, you end up, you know, learning and staying abreast and staying, you know, uh, you know, aware of what's going on amongst the younger people because the young people really, in this space, you know, are the driving factor. So it's important to kind of, you know, at least have some idea of exactly what's going on so you're not caught by surprise when major shifts happen in, in, in the music game.